my name is John Polk, and as you can see from the alphabet suit behind my name, I do have both a JD as well as an LLM, which is in taxation. Uh, but as I'm presenting today, please keep in mind that nothing I say should be considered legal advice. I'm an entity coach here at Traders Accounting, which means that I spend most of my time helping traders set up business entities to trade through to really take advantage of all of the tax benefits that are available when you trade as a business. And I was particularly gratified to see that uh, Sharisha's comment was the one that was chosen because that's really what we'll be talking about today, the tax benefits and the tax pros and cons of trading as a business. There are a couple of things that we ask you to keep in mind as I'm presenting today. The first is that tax law is changing constantly. We do make every effort to keep this presentation as up-to-date as possible. However, before you rely on any of the information that I'm presenting today, we do recommend consulting with either a tax accountant or a tax attorney. The second thing that we ask you to keep in mind is that Traders Accounting is not a law firm, so none of the advice given here should be considered legal advice. Uh, we are an accounting firm, and for about 16 years now, we've been helping traders with all aspects of taxation and trading, including setting up business entities to trade through, tax preparation for individuals who are trading through business entities, as well as individuals who are trading on a Schedule C, and even trading just as an investor, helping traders with their bookkeeping, as well as for the bookkeeping on their business, uh, help traders with coaching to ensure that they're really maintaining these entities and using them to their full advantage. Then we also help traders set up self-directed 401ks so they can better manage their retirement assets and set up a revocable living trust to really take care of their estate planning needs. And as you can see from this list of services, we really try and live up to our motto, you trade and we do the rest. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about us or get in touch, we invite you to check out our website at www.tradersaccounting.com. Give us a call at 800-938-9513. Email us at learnattradersaccounting.com. And we also invite you to check out our blog, the address of which is at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to be covering quite a bit of information today and covering it quickly. And so if you have any questions as we're moving through, uh, please just type them into that question comment box, and then at the end we'll have time for a Q&A and get through as many of those questions as we can. Uh, but with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started with the meat of the presentation. And I'd like to start these by taking a look at this quote from Judge Leonard Hand, because it really provides the philosophical background for everything we do here at Traders Accounting. And it says that anyone may arrange their affairs so that their taxes shall be as low as possible. You are not bound to choose the pattern which best pays the treasury. There is not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. Over and over again, the courts have said that there is nothing sinister in so arranging affairs as to keep taxes as low as possible. Everyone does it, rich and poor alike, and I'll do right, for nobody owes any public duty to pay more in taxes than the law demands. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today, arranging your affairs, setting up your trading business, so that you don't pay any more in taxes than the law requires you to. And the benefits of trading in a tax efficient trading plan, trading in a situation where you've improved your tax situation, are really twofold. The first is that by paying less in taxes, you'll have more to trade with. And having more to trade with gives you the ability to see more profits and to see those profits sooner. And I use the metaphor of the two paths to profit when I talk about improving your tax situation. On the left, we have trading without taking any specific steps to improve your tax situation. And you can certainly make it to the goal of profit on this path, but you're going to be moving slower, and you'll never know what's around that corner when you might run into unanticipated tax issues with things like the $3,000 capital loss limitation and the wash sale rules, uh, both of which we'll discuss in much greater detail today. This path on the right represents trading inside of a tax efficient trading plan, trading where you've improved your tax situation. And by doing so, you'll be able to move quicker towards your goal of profit by paying less in taxes, and along the way, take steps to avoid that $3,000 capital loss limitation and the wash sale rules. And so today I'm going to take you through uh, just the difference between these two paths, 
and the steps necessary to get on to that second, uh, more improved path. Taxes really are your single largest trading expense, and it's very self-intuitive that as you make more, as you see higher profits, your tax bill is going to increase. But even in years where you have a substantial loss, taxes remain your single largest trading expense due to the $3,000 capital loss limitation preventing you from using that loss to offset profits. But because taxes are your single largest trading expense, by taking write-offs for every dollar you can write off against your taxes, your cash flow is going to increase. This increased cash flow is going to lead to more profit. And so by taking the steps to uh, really improve your tax situation, it really helps you maximize that cash flow inside your trading and by maximizing the cash flow, maximize your ability to generate profits. And so to talk about how to improve that tax status, first we need to get a little bit more into the specifics of just how you're taxed and how the US tax code is going to apply to you as a trader. And there are really two tax codes in this country. There's the individual tax code, which you all are familiar with, and then there's the business tax code. And that business tax code is the one that we'd like to take advantage of. Take advantage of those lower tax rates being paid by businesses, as well as the additional expenses that the businesses are allowed to deduct. And both of these are legal and available for you to use for your trading activities. Uh, you simply decide which one you'd like to apply to you, and then take the steps necessary to ensure that your activity uh, really qualifies for that taxation method. And to be taxed as a business, it really helps to know just what the IRS considers a business to be. And they use what's called the economic performance or all events test to determine if your activity rises to the level of a business. This test really is exactly what it sounds like. They look at all of the facts and circumstances surrounding that activity, and based on all of those factors, make the determination. And to give you an idea of just how broad the IRS can look when they're making this determination, uh, in one of my favorite tax court cases, the IRS had uh, taken a look at a husband and wife who had retired and were operating a dog breeding business in their retirement. The IRS made the argument that because they enjoyed dog breeding, it couldn't possibly be a business. And thankfully, the tax court uh, struck down that particular rationale. But it is a very good example of just how broad the IRS can go when they're making this determination. Having said that, there are 10 specific factors that the IRS prefers to use when they're making this determination. And no single one is decisive, but they do rely on these 10 specific factors primarily. First, whether or not you're carrying on the activity in a business-like manner. Second, whether the time and effort that you put into the activity shows that you intend to make it profitable. Whether or not you depend on the income from the activity for your livelihood whether your losses are due to circumstances beyond your control or if they're normal in the startup phase of your type of business, whether you ever make changes to your methods of operation in an attempt to improve profitability, whether you or your advisors have the knowledge necessary to carry on the activity as a successful business, whether you've been successful in making a profit in similar activities in the past, whether the activity has made a profit in some years, whether you can expect to make a future profit from the appreciation of the assets that you're using in the activity, and whether the activity has produced a profit in at least three out of the last five years. But so once you qualify as a business, uh, once you meet those 10 factors, then you can deduct expenses as a business. And as an active trader in business, the expenses that you can deduct are pretty fantastic. First, uh, you can, of course, deduct any expense required to set up a trading business, including the formation of a new business entity to trade through, as well as depreciation for any furniture and equipment that you're using in that trading business. Uh, with the start of a new business, you can actually look back 15 months and recapture any expenses that you previously paid that weren't deductible when you paid them, uh, but are now going to be deductible through this trading business. You can deduct the cost of using your personal vehicle in the trading business, and typically we see that in conjunction with uh, driving to an educational event. 
But for 2014, that deduction is going to be 56 cents per mile, which is actually down a half cent from 2013. But then because you are a business, you can now deduct payroll to employees, including any payroll taxes that you've paid, any contributions to a qualified pension plan, like a self-directed 401k, as well as uh, what's called a medical expense reimbursement plan. One of the biggest advantages to operating your trading through a C corporation is that you can then essentially deduct medical expenses 100% through the business. You can also deduct expenses that are directly related to trading itself, including any dues and subscriptions for platform and data fees, magazines, news services, newsletters, newspapers, trading organizations, and even your satellite radio subscription. You can deduct the cost of any educational expenses that you pay, any home study, seminars, or trade shows. You can also deduct really the direct cost of operating a business itself, any licenses and permits that you're required to have, any office equipment that you're purchasing, uh, you can deduct part of the cost of using your home for a home office through the home office deduction. You can deduct any bank service charges, office supplies, software purchases, uh, home utilities like telephone, internet connection, and TV. Uh, of course, professional fees, including accounting and tax preparation, and then any travel and entertainment for business purpose, which again we most commonly see in conjunction with educational events, but this would include the hotel, any meals you eat while you're traveling, and then of course the travel itself. Our clients uh, typically see between seven and $35,000 per year uh, spread throughout all these deductions. And as you can imagine, a benefit like that does come with some pretty strict requirements. And the IRS really views deductions at a, as a matter of legislative grace. And so the taxpayer must maintain adequate records to substantiate the amounts of any deductions or credits that you're claiming. And this is really going to be a matter of good bookkeeping practices. But beyond that, the IRS puts the burden on you as the taxpayer to keep adequate records showing that you are entitled to all income or to any credits and deductions that you're claiming. And so the burden is on you to show that you are entitled to be taxed as a business. And so that's really the difference between being taxed under the individual tax code and then the business tax code. A finer distinction is whether you're going to be taxed as an individual under that individual code or the business tax code, or whether you'll be trading under a business entity and taxed under that business tax code. And each of these statuses really has a different name. An investor is an individual that's being taxed under that individual tax code. The trader in securities is an individual that's being taxed as a business. If you're operating through a business entity, you can either be taxed as a C corporation, which is a completely standalone business entity, or you can be taxed through what are called the pass-through entities. And these pass-through entities are so-called because they pass through income and expense to the members of that entity. The pass-through entities include the limited liability corporation, which really is the single best pass through entity to use for trading purposes. The subchapter S corporation, which is the single worst entity to use for trading purposes. Then the limited liability partnership, which is a somewhat antiquated form of business to use for trading, but still does offer some benefits to the individual trader. And we're going to walk through each of these statuses in turn and really discuss just how the IRS treats them. And so investors, Generally, they're thought of as people who are looking for long-term appreciation and dividends, but this is the default tax status. So any trader that doesn't take steps to improve their tax status is going to be treated as an investor. And an investor really is a pretty terrible tax status to have for trading purposes, because investors are specifically barred by the IRS from taking certain investment-related expenses as deductions. These include certain types of commissions and brokerage fees, but the biggest one is that as an investor, you are barred from deducting any educational expense. And so as an investor, you really lose that major source of deduction. And you can take some of those expenses that I mentioned earlier, some of that seven to 35,000, 
it can be deducted as an investor, but then you can only deduct it if you're itemizing. And there, those expenses are going to be subject to a 2% AGI threshold. And not only are investors subject to that 2% AGI threshold on the deductions they can take, as well as being outright barred from taking certain investment-related expenses, they also run into issues with $3,000 capital loss limitation and then the wash sale rules. The $3,000 capital loss limitation comes into play if you have a capital loss that exceeds $3,000 in any one year. And typically, any gain or loss from trading is going to be capital in nature. Capital loss can offset capital gain 100%, but capital loss can only offset $3,000 of ordinary income in any one year. And to give you an idea of why this can be so terrible, we've got an example of a trader who in 2012 has ordinary income, a W-2 income, something like that, of $100,000. And they have a terrible year trading and have a capital loss of $100,000. Because of this $3,000 capital loss limitation, their taxable income for that year is going to be $97,000. And they have a suspended capital loss of $97,000. In 2012, you can see how your wealth has unchanged, but you're still paying tax on that $97,000. And carrying that loss forward into future years is the reason that even in a losing year, taxes really remain your single largest trading expense. The wash sale rules are another mechanism by which loss can be carried forward into a future year. And a wash sale occurs when you sell a security at a loss, and within 30 days, either before or after the date of that sale, you repurchase that same security or a substantially similar one. For the purposes of the wash sale rule, a substantially similar security includes any option that's on the same underlying stock. Uh, but when a wash sale occurs, the loss on that initial sale is disallowed, then the basis in the newly acquired replacement stock is adjusted to the account for that loss. To give you an idea of what that looks like, we have our example of a trader who owns Microsoft with a basis of $25 per share. And at the end of 2013, when it's trading at $23 a share, this trader sells it, taking a loss of $2 per share. But because they like Microsoft or they like the dividend, for whatever reason, they go ahead and repurchase it on January 1st of 2014 uh, while it's still trading at $23 a share. Because this repurchase was within 30 days of a sale at a loss, the wash sale rules come into play. And so the loss on the initial sale is disallowed, and the basis in that newly acquired stock is stepped up to $25 a share. And as you can imagine, it's a pretty big administrative headache to keep track of these wash sales throughout the year and make sure you're carrying forward that basis properly. But in a situation like this, where the wash is coming at the end of the year, this can have the effect of carrying some pretty substantial loss forward into a future year, much like that $3,000 capital loss limitation does. And so by doing so, it leaves you holding the bag and paying tax in the year where you actually had that loss. So this $3,000 capital loss limitation and then the wash sale rules are really the two biggest tax issues that face investors and the two biggest tax rules that can cause issues that really surprise investors as they're trading. So as an individual, you can be taxed as an investor, which is under that individual tax code, or you can be taxed as a trader in securities and that trader in securities is an individual being taxed under the business tax code. A trader in securities can deduct all of the expenses I ran through earlier and doesn't need to do anything extra as far as filing. Uh, the trader in securities, it's also known as a sole proprietorship. It's just a different name for the same tax status. But there's no election necessary to file as a trader in securities. If you qualify, uh, you simply file a Schedule C with your 1040 tax return and then deduct all of your trading business expenses on that Schedule C. Being a trader in securities is pretty fantastic because it does allow you to take those deductions. But there are some concerns that come up with this status. First, uh, there is nothing in the tax code about just what a trader in securities is. Instead, 
everything we know about it comes from IRS Publication 550, which sets forth the special rules for traders and securities, and then tax court cases, where taxpayers have attempted to file as traders and securities, and the issue has gone before the tax court. But beyond that, individuals trading in a sole proprietorship are audited much more often than individuals who are trading as investors or people who are trading through formal business entities. And the biggest reason for that is because when you file as a trader in securities, you end up with a Schedule C on your tax return showing expenses with no income. And that uh, expense with no income is definitely going to be a flag for the IRS. And if you're trading through formal business entities, those are going to be much less subject to audit. But the IRS Publication 550 is the document that gives us the special rules for traders and securities. And it sets forth three requirements for being considered a traders and securities by the IRS. First, a trader in securities must seek to profit from daily market movements in the price of securities and not from dividends, interest, or capital appreciation. Second, a trader in securities must have substantial activity in the market. And third, a trader in securities must carry on the activity with both continuity and regularity. Uh, much like the initial distinction between an activity and a business, the definition for a trader's securities and meeting these requirements is also based on a facts and circumstances test. So in order to determine if you're looking to profit from those daily changes in market price rather than the long-term appreciation and dividends, the IRS looks at the tip of the holding periods for the securities that you're buying and selling. In order to determine if your activity is substantial, they take a look at both the frequency and dollar amount of your trades during the year. And in order to determine if you're trading with both continuity and regularity, they look at the amount of time that you devote to the activity. But this is really all the IRS gives us. Uh, they don't tell us what holding periods are sufficient. Uh, they don't tell us how many trades and what dollar amount of trades during the year will meet these requirements or what amount of time that they're going to require from you. So to get a little bit more information, we turn to the tax court cases. And there are really four major cases when it comes to the trader and securities tax status. The first, uh, Chen v. Commissioner, is really the first big case where we saw the trader and securities tax status being used. And in that case, uh, we had a trader who had about 300 trades during the year in question. These trades were made over the course of about three months. And also throughout the year, he spent quite a bit of money and time on trading education. The court took a look at this and found that those 300 trades were not, su not sufficient because they'd been clustered in that three-month period at the beginning of the year. And for the rest of the year, uh, Mr. Chen did not trade at all. And so based on that factor, that the trading was clustered into one three-month period and not continuous throughout the year, the IRS disallowed the trader and securities tax status. The next case we have is Holzinger v. Commissioner. And in Holzinger v. Commissioner, we had a husband and wife team trading together. They had set up an LLC specifically to use for trading and had more than 300 trades in the year in question. The IRS took a look at their case and again denied the trader and securities tax status. In doing so, they pointed out that the holding period on those trades, um, on perhaps 90% of the trades in question, the holding period was longer than 30 days. Then despite having 300 trades during the year, they were trading on less than 50% of the available trading days again, not trading continuously. Then even though the Holzingers had set up an LLC to use for trading purposes, all of the trading was carried out in personal accounts. And so based on those factors, uh, the long holding period is, and the lack of continuous trading primarily, the IRS again disallowed the trade and securities tax status. In KV Commissioner, we had a trader who had trades worth over $20 million in the year in question. But those trades had occurred on only 84 trades and 
really clustered in only a couple of months at the beginning of the year. And so in KB Commissioner, the IRS, again, disallowed the trade and securities tax status, primarily based on the lack of continuous trading throughout the year. Then in our most recent case, we have Endicott v. Commissioner. And in Endicott v. Commissioner, we had a trader who had over 1,000 trades in the year in question. The IRS disallowed his trader securities tax status, despite the fact that he had 1,000 trades, and those trades were spread out during the entire year. And they disallowed it because these trades were almost entirely uh, covered calls based on substantial long-term positions that the taxpayer had. And so because his positions were uh, really long-term in nature, and the majority of his trading was long-term, they again disallowed that trade and securities tax status. So from these cases, we really learn a couple of things. Uh, one of the biggest things that the IRS is looking for is continuity of trading throughout the year, uh, continuously acting in a business-like manner. On top of that, uh, no single one of these factors is sufficient. Even if you have a 1,000 trades, uh, you really need to be trading with continuity and regularity, and those holding periods need to be short. Even if you have 300 trades in the year in question, they need to be spread out throughout the entire year rather than clustered into a three-month period. And so that trader and securities tax status really can be one of the biggest benefits to your trading or one of the biggest headaches, depending on just what's going on with your personal situation. So in order to decide whether or not you should file as a trader in securities, you really need to weigh the benefits. Being able to deduct that seven dollars to $35,000 per year of trading expenses against the downsides, the uncertainty of the law, as well as the increased frequency of IRS audits. Or, in the alternative, you can trade in a flow-through entity or a standalone business entity. Those flow-through entities, again, include the limited partnership, which is antiquated but okay to use for trading, the Subchapter S Corporation, which should never be used for trading, and then the LLC, which really is the flow-through entity of choice for trading purposes. And that's because the LLCs are a creation of state law rather than federal law. So in an LLC, we get a great deal of flexibility on just how we'd like them to pay their taxes. But the owners of an LLC are called the members. And an LLC can either be managed by one person in a manager-managed LLC or by all of the members in a member-managed LLC. The IRS considers single-member LLCs to be discarded entities. So to gain the benefits of working through an LLC, you really do need to have at least two members. And that second member can be a spouse, a child, so long as the child is over 18, any other family member, a friend, another standalone business entity like a C corporation, or even a trust specifically set up to serve as that second member. But once it has the second member, the LLC can then be taxed as a partnership. And so the LLC would pay no tax whatsoever. Instead, the profits from trading flow through to the members as well as the expenses of trading, with no payroll tax being owed on those profits, and then with the same characterization of income. So if there were going to be capital gains inside the LLC, they would be capital gains on your personal return. If it was 1256 gain in the LLC, then it would be 1256 on your personal return. In addition to that, uh, the LLC is going to be taxed under that business tax code. And so it's going to be able to deduct and pass through the deductions onto you personally. You can also operate in a C corporation, which is a complete standalone entity. This means that the corporation is going to be paying its own taxes, but it pays these at a much lower rate than you and I do. 15% uh, on the first 50,000 of profit, for example. In addition, the corporations do have a couple of special tax rules that make them especially attractive to trading businesses, and they're considered to be a business as soon as they're set up. The special tax rules that the C Corporation can take advantage of are all related to providing benefits to yourself and your family members. In a C Corporation, 
you can use what's called a medical expense reimbursement plan to reimburse yourself 100% for any out-of-pocket expense you're paying for any sort of medical care for yourself and your family. This reimbursement is a non-taxable event to yourself, and it allows you to deduct 100% of the medical expense against trading profit, rather than taking that medical deduction on your personal return, or you'd be subject to the 10% AGI limitation. And that medical expense reimbursement plan is really only available to you if you're operating through a C corporation. On top of that, the corporation is the best entity to use if you're going to be paying yourself or your family a wage. Then based on that wage, you can make contributions into a qualified retirement account based on yourself and your family, like a self-directed 401k plan. And so with that C corporation, it really is much easier to pay wages to yourself and your family and make those retirement contributions, allowing you to move more of your funds into qualified protected accounts rather than keeping it in a non-qualified personal account and paying tax on future profits. You can combine these business entities and recognize the benefits of both. And in one of these combination entities, you would have a management corporation that was being owned by yourself and your family. And the management corporation would be there to pay expenses and to provide benefits. So the corporation would pay all the expense of operating the trading business, including uh, paying for any travel and education and reimbursing you for using part of your home through that home office as well as providing benefits through the medical expense reimbursement plan, paying wages and making those retirement account contributions. Uh, the income to do this would come from the LLC, which would be the trading entity. The owners of the LLC, uh, would, it would be split between yourself and that corporation. Ideally, you would arrange things so that the LLC is passing just enough profit up to the corporation to pay the expenses as well as reimburse you for medical expenses and make contributions to a retirement account while passing just enough up to you uh, directly rather than through the corporation to allow you to capture trading profit without paying any sort of payroll tax. And so by using the combination entity, you really can receive both the benefits of being able, able to provide medical and retirement benefits as well as receive profits without paying any sort of payroll tax. And we use these entities, uh, we help traders set up these entities to use for their trading business because it allows them to deduct the trading expenses, deduct that seven to $35,000 per year without worrying about the special rules for traders. With a business entity, you can look back at least 12 months and recapture expenses that you've already paid but were unable to deduct, moving those expenses into the current year and allowing you to deduct them. By using an entity, you really can maximize your tax benefits, and by doing so, have more money to use for trading. In addition, by operating through a business entity, you really enable yourself to receive the perks of operating a home-based business. The biggest perk, of course, is going to be able to deduct part of your home through the home office deduction. But in addition to that, with the business entity, you can reimburse yourself for trading and certainly make attending things like educational events in other cities a much more attractive proposition because you can now deduct the cost of that trip as a business expense. Finally, by using a business entity to use for trading and really by using a business entity for any type of business, you're really giving yourself a great deal of wealth protection, insulating and isolating your personal assets from your business assets to protect yourself from any sort of judgment that comes against you. And so we come back to my two paths to profit. On the left, we have trading taxed as an investor, trading without taking any steps to improve your tax situation. As an investor, you're specifically prohibited from deducting certain investment-related expenses, and even the ones you can deduct, you're limited in the amount that you can be taking. Also, as an investor, you never know when you're going to run into issues with that $3,000 capital loss limitation or the wash sale rules, further slowing your path to profit. On the right, 
we have trading inside of a tax-efficient trading plan, trading inside of a business that you've maximized for trading. By doing so, you can deduct 100% of expenses related to trading, including things like the home office deduction and travel, entertainment. In addition, you can take steps to avoid the effects of both that $3,000 capital loss limitation and the wash sale rules, really allowing you to move much quicker towards your goal of profit. And so I've talked about a number of different setups and a number of different arrangements for your trading business. And which one of these is going to work best for you is a very individual discussion. And if you'd like some help matching up your personal circumstances to the type of business entity, the type of business structure that would give you the biggest tax benefit, uh, please send us an email at learnattradersaccounting.com and we can get you scheduled for a free 30-minute consultation with one of our business development consultants here at Traders Accounting to discuss which one of these structures would get you the most tax benefit. And even if you're not up to that 300 trades per year or 200 trades per year or even just starting out in paper trading, if you'd like to take that opportunity to discuss sort of these tax issues in more detail and how they apply specifically to you and your individual situation, uh, please let us know and we can have that 30-minute consultation as well. This is not just for traders who have been active for a while. Uh, but so now that we've talked about the benefits to operating your trading through a business entity, I'd like to take a couple of minutes and talk about starting these businesses up. And really who you have create the business entity to begin with does make a difference because there are some decisions that you'll need to make as part of setting up that business which can have an effect on how the business is taxed. And anyone can start up their own. Uh, there are a number of websites where you can create LLCs and most Secretary of States will actually provide the necessary forms. But really make sure your incorporator understands trading. And please keep in mind that we here at Traders Accounting would very much like to help you create these entities and have a plan in place that ensures your success creating and funding and using these trading businesses. But the biggest issues, the biggest decisions that you'll make when you're setting up that trading business are all related to the taxation of traders and some of the special tax rules that traders run into. So by default, uh, trading is taxed as capital gain or capital loss. Long-term capital gain, anything you're holding more than a year, being taxed at 0, 15, or 20% based on your holding period, or based on your ordinary income level. Short-term capital gain, anything that you're holding less than a year, is going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. There's also what's called Section 1256 taxation, and this applies mostly to futures, broad-based index options, binary options, things of that nature, but can apply to Forex transactions if you make the proper elections. And that 1256 is 60% long-term capital gain, 40% short-term capital gain, regardless of your holding period. But capital gains run into some issues, particularly that $3,000 capital loss limitation. And one of the decisions that you can make when creating this business is the mark-to-market -market election, which will affect how that gain is handled. And the mark-to-market -market election really is the most important decision you can make when you're creating your trading business because it's really only available to trading businesses. And the election has the effect of changing any capital gain and loss to ordinary income and ordinary loss. For short-term trading, this means that you're not going to pay any more tax on your profits, but it will allow you to deduct 100% of your losses in the year in which you take them rather than being forced to carry them forward into a future year. In addition, it completely removes you from the effects of the wash sale rules. Instead of having to worry about whether or not you sold a position within 30 days, instead you report net gain or loss for the year without any sort of carry forward into future years. There are some pretty stringent rules on when and how you can make this election as you can imagine, for something as valuable as the mark-to-market -market election. Uh, but the easiest way to make it is going to be with the formation of a brand new business entity. If you make it for an existing entity, then that election 
is going to be need to be made with the last unextended date to file the tax return for the previous tax year. Typically, traders that work with options and stocks uh, will make that mark-to-market -market election because it does get them the advantage of ignoring the wash sale rules and that $3,000 capital loss limitation. But there are some types of traders that typically avoid that mark-to-market -market election. The first group is going to be traders who are going to be working with futures or broad-based index options, anything taxed under Section 1256. These Section 1256 contracts get a beneficial tax rate. 60% uh, of your net gain or loss for the year is going to be taxed as long-term and 40% is short-term, regardless of the holding period. So with these 1256 contracts, you're going to be paying less in taxes to begin with. In addition, they are very simple to report. You only need to list the uh, total gain or loss for the year per broker on Form 6781, instead of being required to track each trade and holding period as you would for standard uh, Schedule D. If you have any open futures contracts on December 31st, they are considered to be closed for tax purposes. And so you would recognize any unrealized gain or loss in that same year. And you treat it as if you had repurchased those positions at the same basis starting with January 1st. If you have losses from these 1256 contracts, you can carry them back three years and forward five years to use those losses to offset future and past profit. And the mark-to-market -market election is generally not made by these traders because by making the mark-to-market -market election, they would lose that beneficial 60-40 split. And then the uh, 1256 contracts are already not subject to the wash sale rules. Then we have the Forex traders. And Forex, by default, is taxed under Section 988 giving it ordinary income and ordinary loss treatment. So already, if you're working with Forex, you're taking advantage of all the benefits of that mark-to-market -market election. But you do have the ability to treat those Forex transactions as if they were Section 1256 trades, paying that lower tax rate at that 60-40 split. This election for Forex is made on a trade-by-trade -trade basis rather than as a universal election like the mark-to-market -market election would be but it does allow you to uh, really make the proper election for your tax situation at the time and gives you quite a bit more flexibility than the mark-to-market -market election does. And so Forex traders will typically avoid making that mark-to-market uh, -market election, so they have the option to have their Forex trading treated under Section 1256. So that's going to finish the tax portion of the presentation, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes and talk about the other services that Traders Accounting can provide, uh, but then we will turn it over to the Q&A. Uh, but as I mentioned, we can help you set up any of the business entities that we've discussed today, including any of the combination structures. We can help you with coaching to ensure that you're operating your business entity properly to maintain its uh, status as a business from an IRS perspective. We can help you with any tax or entity questions that come up specific to trading. We can help you prepare taxes for any of these entities, as well as any estate taxes or trust taxes. We can help you with bookkeeping to ensure that you're keeping the records necessary to really substantiate all of the deductions that you're receiving and ensure that you're receiving the maximum deductions possible. Then we can help you set up a self-directed 401k plan to better manage your individual retirement future, as well as a family living trust to take care of your estate planning needs. And the self-directed 401k plan is really a, a pretty exciting tool that investors are using with their trading businesses through Traders Accounting. And the self-directed 401k really does provide some pretty huge benefits. Uh, first, with the self-directed 401k, at any point, you can borrow up to 50000 from that 401k plan, then put it into service in your trading business. So you can really move funds out of that qualified retirement account and allow you to trade margin with those retirement funds. 
any profits that are growing inside that 401k plan is of course going to be growing without paying any tax on those profits until you're pulling them out in the future. Or in the case of a Roth 401k plan, uh, you would have already paid the taxes, and so the assets would grow tax-free and then be taken out tax-free in the future. Any contributions that you're making into that plan are going to be deductible, as well as portions of the payroll uh, tax associated with those contributions. Currently, you can put over $51,000 per year into a traditional 401k plan, uh, growing your retirement assets by that $51,000, and $17,500 into a Roth 401k plan. Inside of a self-directed 401k plan, these assets are really extremely protected, being held in yet a third uh, entity outside of yourself and your business. And perhaps the most important and exciting part of this 401k plan for traders is that it does allow you to take personal charge of your retirement future, letting you make investment decisions uh, for your plan instead of relying on any sort of pre-sorted asset mix like you would have experienced in the past with an employer's 401k plan. And I've saved this slide for last because it really is the most important thing that I have to talk about. And without having your taxes prepared properly, everything else that I've discussed today really becomes worthless. So we really do suggest that you make sure that your tax preparer understands how traders are taxed. And we suggest these three questions to help you gauge just how comfortable they are with the topic. First, what is mark to market and how do I elect it? And again, that mark to market election changes any gain and loss from trading into ordinary income and ordinary loss, as well as removes you from the effects of the wash sale rules. And it's made with the start of a new business or by the last unextended day to file your taxes for the previous tax year. Second, what are wash sales? And those wash sales occur when you sell a security at a loss, then within 30 days, either before or after, repurchase that same security or substantially similar one. And then a wash sale event, the loss in that initial sale is disallowed, and the basis in that replacement stock is increased to account for the loss. Finally, how are Section 1256 contracts taxed? A net gain or loss for the year is taxed as 60% long-term capital gain, 40% short-term capital gain, regardless of the holding period. And please remember that you can always use us here at Traders Accounting for any of your tax preparation needs. So if you'd like some information directly from Traders Accounting about what I discussed today, as well as uh, archived recordings of this presentation and presentation slides, uh, please send me an email at learnattradersaccounting.com and just put the following items in the subject window letting me know what you'd like to receive back. Presentation slides, a presentation recording, expense sheets, more information on IRAs, and more information on the IRS distinction between a business or hobby. But I want to thank you all very much for your attention during that presentation. And now we're going to turn it over to the uh, Q&A. Let's see. Wayne asks, if you have accumulated losses over several years in excess of $3,000, can you write off all of those losses in one year's tax return if you form an entity? Unfortunately, not. Um, those accumulated losses over several years, your entire capital loss carry forward is going to carry forward on that personal return. By forming a business entity, you can recapture any expense you've paid related to trading with the exception of those trading losses. Certainly moving forward in the entity, any capital gain you have from trading can be offset by that capital loss carry forward on your personal return but the carried forward capital loss is not something that can automatically be deducted by forming a business entity. Let's see, Rose asks, 
can binary option trading be an acceptable trading business? Absolutely. So long as you are uh, actively trading throughout the year, then those binary options will absolutely satisfy the requirements to be taxed as a trading business. In addition, uh, with those binary options, you will be seeing that 1256 tax treatment, and so would be seeing a lower tax rate on profits than you might otherwise would be. Rose asks, uh, where did the trading expenses of the LLC show up on the member's tax return? Any expenses related to trading are going to flow through from the LLC on a Schedule K-1 and will be taken as an ordinary expense on page 2 of Schedule E. Uh, essentially, it shows up as an ordinary deduction against income on the front page of the 1040. And if your broker is in a, issuing that Form 6781, uh, you can absolutely just report that on your return. Let's see. And there are some questions here that are just a little bit beyond the scope of what I can get into in this format. Uh, but if I'm not answering your question, please send me an email at learnatradersaccounting.com and we can set up a time to discuss that in a much more interactive format. Uh, TJ asks, can the 50000 from a 401k be done only once per individual? Uh, that 50000 is going to be a limit on the total amount that you can borrow from the 401k at any point, uh, but you can certainly borrow 50000 repay it, and then rebar that 50000 in one year. And if a husband and wife each have their own 401k plan through a business entity, then they could each borrow that 50000 from that plan. Let's see. Sharish asks, if the brokerage account gives the year-end statement with and without wash sales, which should which one should be used? Uh, if you're filing, at, well, either way, if you're filing as a trader of securities or as an investor, you're going to want to file with the wash sales unless you have the uh, mark-to-market election in place. And then if one has the choice between Forex futures or options, which is better from the point of taxation benefit and complexity? Really, no single one of those is going to be preferable. Um, each one has different options in how we can treat the taxation. Uh, on those options, of course, we'd be looking at the mark-to-market. -market. With the futures, it would be treated under that Section 1256. And with the Forex, we have the option to choose one or the other. Uh, but So each one of those types of trading is pretty much going to be the same from a tax perspective over time. Having said that, it's very true that we'll the futures and the forex are going to be subject to a lower tax on profits, given that 60-40 split. Randall asks, uh, "Would I be able to trade, or would I be able to write off my past trading educational classes earlier this year if I were to create an entity now and have about a thousand trades in my personal account for the future?" And you can absolutely bring forward past educational expenses so long as you meet the requirements for an active trader moving forward. Um, if you've made 100 trades in your personal account up to this point, that's a little bit below where we'd like to see you in order to be taxed as a business. But if you increase that trading frequency in the future, as well as increase the continuity of your, your trading, then it's absolutely possible to bring those expenses forward. And really, it's just going to be based on just how active you are as a trader. Let's see. Deborah asks, so what are the fees associated with forming an LLC compared to a limited partnership in California? And with both those entities, the fees are going to be pretty much the same in terms of setup. 
and that's going to include an $800 franchise tax paid to California, a $25 initial registration, and then there are some other fees, including the state filing fee that I'm not familiar with off the top of my head, and the fee to the actual document preparer that creates the entity uh, is going to come in around $1,000. Uh, Rose asks, might the IRS consider binary options gambling and to be taken as a Schedule A loss? And uh, probably not, although based on the options, there's a chance that they may treat it differently. The issue with taking those as a Schedule A loss is that they can only be deducted to the extent where you're seeing gambling winnings. Um, really, the better way to treat them is under that Section 1256. And so uh, we would take those as just a capital loss and offset against capital gains in future and past years through the Section 1256. Dan asks, uh, to form a business entity, do I need a second person or a trust? And in order to form an LLC that is uh, worthwhile to use for trading purposes uh, from a tax perspective, you will need either a second person uh, another business entity like a C corporation or a trust. But it is very possible to have any of those entities set up to work with this business structure. And if you want to operate solely through a C corporation, then it is possible to do it uh, just as an individual without needing a separate entity. Wayne asks, uh, I trade futures, options, uh, stock options, and futures. Is there a best entity and election process for this cross-platform trading style? And for something like this, uh, really the best option is to have all your trading just in one single entity. And it is possible to make the mark-to-market -mark election such that it would apply only to the stock options while leaving the futures and futures options alone so you can still take advantage of that Section 1256 taxation. But so the trick is really just in the wording of that election that's made inside the business entity. So from a tax perspective there, it's not going to make much of a difference in the entity choice, so long as we make the mark-to-market -mark election appropriately. And really, unless you're worrying substantially about medical expenses, then the LLC is going to be the best entity to use for those purposes. See, and there are some excellent questions here uh, that really just are beyond what we can get into in this format. Uh, so if you are asking a question and I'm not answering it, uh, thank you very much for having a good question. And please email me to set up that consultation so we can talk about it in more detail. John asks, do all states have a franchise fee when filing for an LLC? Uh, absolutely not. It varies substantially from state to state in terms of cost. Uh, California is one of the most expensive states to have an entity set up in at this point because of their $800 franchise fee. Uh, but for comparison, in a state like Arizona, the filing fee is roughly $100 and no franchise fee throughout the year. So it does very much from state to state. And that discussion of your individual state is definitely one that we can answer if you shoot us that email. Ava asks, how far back can educational expenses be captured if an entity has been created and trader and security status is achieved? Is there a monetary limit on that educational expense that can be deducted as a startup expense? The, the only limitation on these expenses is that you can look back 18 months from the date that you make your first trade. Uh, you bring all those pre-organization expenses into the LLC and you can take $5,000 as a one-time deduction in the first year. Then in future years, the remaining uh, expense is amortized and carried over 15 years. But you can look back and take essentially a limited dollar amount as the total pre-organization expenses, but then you would be subject to that $5,000 one-time limitation in the first year of your active trading business.
see, Rose asks, uh, for futures are binary, am I correct that the losses and gains are netted for 1256 purposes? Absolutely. Um, all of those, all the 1256 uh, taxation is going to be netted out against each other uh, for those 1256 purchases or purposes. Let's see, RR asks, if you're a resident of New Jersey, can you set up an LLC in Arizona for trading? Are there any advantages to doing that? And it depends on the states we're talking about. And off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with New Jersey's rules surrounding what are called essentially foreign LLCs. But some states, and especially like California, are still going to be charging you whatever local fees that they typically charge, even if the LLC is set up in a different state. Um, but we can certainly check on what it's going to look like in terms of state to state. But for some situations, it can make a very big difference if you set up in another state to avoid things like annual taxes. But that does look like all of the questions I have, or at least that I can answer today. Uh, again, thank you very much for having me. And if you have any further questions or would like to schedule that free 30-minute consultation, uh, please send me that email at john at traders or excuse me at learn at tradersaccounting.com. All right, John, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. We did have one last question come in. I don't know if you wanted to address it or not. Yeah, I just saw that come in, and uh, definitely that's one that's going to be a little bit better to talk about in person rather than over the webinar. Okay. All right, guys, um, we've been working with Traders Accounting for five years now, and we've been sending our, our students uh, from Investor Success over there, and we've got nothing but rave reviews. We've worked with them ourselves. We have uh, sent a lot of people their way, and everyone's come back extremely happy. Uh, they are offering a 30-minute free consultation, so whether you end up working with them or not, I highly recommend that you take them up on the consultation, at least uh, get some more clarification on your personal situation and your questions. Uh, definitely take them up on that. They are a great company, a lot of integrity. Um, they are one of the very few accounting firms uh, that I'm aware of that uh, focus on uh, trading issues and the laws, tax laws as they apply to traders. Uh, we can't recommend them enough. So um, please check them out. Again, there's a 30-minute consultation. The number and email is on the screen. And we definitely recommend that uh, you guys uh, take them up on the, the free consultation. So, um, John, again, thank you uh, very much for your time today. Uh, it was a great presentation. I appreciate you laying out all the different uh, complications and scenarios when it comes to um, uh, paying taxes and saving on taxes uh, when it comes to uh, trading. I know that's a, um, not a, an easy subject for a lot of people, but you definitely made it uh, a lot easier today. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Laura uh, has commented that uh, she just started working with Traders Accounting, and they are awesome. She just told her trading group, her trading group about them. Um, so, Laura, thank you for that and for confirming that uh, Traders Accounting is just a great company to work with. So, uh, again, please take them up on that free 30-minute consultation. We can't recommend them enough.